On the fateful day of November 22, 1963, at 12.30 p.m., President John F. Kennedy was fatally shot at the Dealey Plaza in downtown Dallas, Texas. The whole country was in shock. People were still trying to make sense of what had happened. Almost 45 minutes later, another murder took place in Dallas. This time, it was police officer J.D. Tippett, who was on patrol in the central Oak Cliff area. Someone had fired four shots at him, mortally wounding him and was on the run. The suspect was later arrested from the Texas theater. His name was Lee Harvey Oswald. This man would later be accused of the president's assassination. Many years on, Oswald is still known as the alleged lone gunman to have assassinated the President of United States. But Officer Tippett's murder has somewhat gone into the background. The murder of Officer J.D. Tippett in Oak Cliff was famously cited by David Bellin, the assistant counsel to the Warren Commission, as the Rosetta Stone case to the solution of the JFK assassination. Following Mr. Bellin's questionable logic might also lead one to believe the opposite to be true. Once it can be proven that Oswald did not kill patrolman Tippett, the case for him having assassinated President Kennedy is, therefore, weakened. I didn't shoot anybody, I'm just a patsy, shouted Oswald to news reporters while in Dallas police custody. He denied his guilt in many ways and more than once. Was he telling the truth? Sadly, within less than 48 hours, shadowy nightclub owner Jack Ruby would terminate the official Dallas police investigation into the Tippett murder when he gunned down the suspect Lee Harvey Oswald in the basement of Dallas police headquarters. That unfathomable event, broadcast live on national television, occurred in the presence of more than 50 Dallas policemen. It was their job to ensure Oswald's safety while he was in custody, so the suspect might be tried on charges of assassinating President Kennedy and murdering Officer Tippett. And despite Bellin's Rosetta Stone reference, not only did Dallas authorities abandon the Tippett case, but the Warren Commission showed almost no real interest in solving the crime. Let's take a look at the official version of the Tippett murder according to the Warren Commission report. The president was shot at 12.30 p.m. from the southeastern window of the sixth floor of Texas School Book Depository. Despite the Dallas police's efforts to close the building, Lee Harvey Oswald managed to leave the Texas School Book Depository at about 12.33 p.m. He then walked east on Elm Street for seven blocks and boarded a bus at around 12.40 p.m. His former landlady Mrs. Mary Bledsoe was also on the same bus and recognized Oswald. The bus was bound for Oak Cliff. The bus headed towards the Dealey Plaza but Oswald took a bus transfer and got off near Lamar Street intersection at around 12.44 p.m. He then walked south on Lamar Street to the Greyhound bus station and took a cab at about 12.48 p.m. He got off the cab at 500 North Beckley at about 12.54 p.m. He then walked to his rooming house at 10.26 North Beckley and reached at about 1 o'clock p.m. Mrs. Erlene Roberts, the housekeeper, saw him enter the house and go into his room. Oswald took a revolver and put on a light-colored zipper jacket. He left his rooming house at about 1.03 p.m. He then briskly walked nine-tenths of a mile and encountered patrolman J.D. Tippett at the 10th Street near the intersection of 10th and Patton at about 1.15 p.m. Tippett, who was on patrol in the area, called Oswald to his car, who came to the passenger side front window. Tippett then got out of the car and walked to the front of the car. 
As he reached the front wheel, Oswald pulled out his revolver and fired at him several times. Tippett got hit by four bullets and died on the spot. Oswald then proceeded west and turned south on Patton Avenue, ejecting empty shells from his revolver. Several witnesses saw him get away from the scene and later identified him in police lineups. Oswald then turned right onto Jefferson Boulevard and proceeded west until he turned north into the parking area behind a gas station a block away. Oswald took off his jacket and put it under a car. He then got back on Jefferson Boulevard and proceeded west. Oswald was observed by Hardy's shoe store manager Johnny Brewer. Brewer felt that Oswald looked funny and scared. He heard police sirens and saw Oswald duck into the Texas theater. He went to Julia Postal, the ticket seller, and asked her if the guy had bought a ticket. Miss Postal then called the police at around 1.40 p.m. When the police arrived at the theater, Johnny Brewer met them and pointed at the man who had got in without a ticket. Patrolman McDonald approached Oswald and asked him to get on his feet. Oswald got up, said, well, it's all over now, punched McDonald in the face and pulled out his revolver. McDonald grabbed Oswald and he couldn't fire. Eventually, Oswald was arrested and taken to the police headquarters. What happened in the downtown area is not under question here, so we shall keep that aside for now and instead focus on the events that took place in the Oak Cliff area of Dallas on November 22, 1963. While Oswald was in his room, housekeeper Mrs. Roberts saw a police car pull up right in front of the house and honk twice. There were two uniformed policemen in the car and the number on the car read 207. Later in her testimony before the Warren Commission, Mrs. Roberts said that the car number was 106 not 207. She further complained that she had been subjected to third degree by the police. The police car could have been number 10 that Tippett was driving, as it was the only police car in the area at that time. When Oswald left his rooming house, Mrs. Roberts saw him walk north on Beckley Street to the bus stop, not south, towards 10th Street. According to the Warren Commission report, Oswald walked from his rooming house to 10th Street for 9 tenths of a mile in about 12 minutes. He had to be jogging to do that, yet no one saw him. However, the time when patrolman Tippett was shot is also under a bit of dispute here. The Warren Commission concluded that the shooting of Tippett has been established at approximately 1.15 or 1.16 p.m. However, witness Domingo Benavides, who used the police radio in Tippett's car to notify the police dispatcher that a police officer had been shot, said that he sat for a few minutes before he got out of his truck. According to the DPD transcript, the time was 1.16 p.m. Mrs. Helen Markham, the star witness in the case, told the Warren Commission that the time was 6 or 7 minutes after 1 p.m. when she saw Tippett's car pull over to the curb. Patrolman R.A. Davenport and W.R. Bardeen, who followed the ambulance carrying Tippett to the Methodist Hospital, submitted in their report that the doctor pronounced Tippett dead at 1.15 p.m. 
The permit for autopsy by the Justice of Peace suggests the same, that Tippett was pronounced dead on arrival at 1.15 p.m. Which obviously means that Tippett was shot much before 1.15 p.m. Making Oswald's journey from his rooming house to the Tippett's murder scene even more impossible. On the other hand, Texas theater manager Butch Burroughs said Oswald entered the theater during 1 p.m. to 1.07 p.m. He also slipped in around between 1 and 1.07. Other movie patrons will similarly report having seen Oswald in the mostly empty theater during the start of the movie, changing seats frequently and sometimes sitting directly next to other moviegoers. Is Oswald supposed to meet someone he doesn't know personally? How could Oswald possibly be at both 10th Street and Texas Theater at the same time? Meanwhile, at 10th and Patton, a wallet is found. Captain Westbrook of the DPD shows a man's wallet to FBI Special Agent Bob Barrett. The Dallas investigators are going through the wallet and apparently find two pieces of ID. Westbrook asks Barrett if he knows who either Lee Harvey Oswald or Alec Hydale are. Barrett says no. But there is no record of any wallet found on the Tippett's murder scene. Apparently, a wallet was recovered from Oswald after his arrest from the Texas theater. Years later, when the story about the wallet is revealed by agent Bob Barrett, the DPD will say that Barrett's memory is faulty and there was no wallet found at the Tippett crime scene. But a check of archived Dallas TV news footage proved the DPD wrong. Later, the story seems to change that some unidentified person in the crowd at Tippett's murder scene must have handed the wallet to reserve cop Sergeant Kenneth Croy, the first officer on site. Croy, incredibly, never filed a written report on that day and in his testimony before the Warren Commission said he knew several of the officers who eventually responded to the shooting at 10th and Patton, but couldn't remember name of any of them. Now this is so bizarre. There is video evidence of the wallet being found at the Tippett crime scene and according to an FBI agent, the wallet had IDs connecting it to Lee Harvey Oswald and Alec Hydale. This was supposed to be a slam-dunk evidence to implicate Oswald for both Tippett and the president's murder. As the rifle, allegedly used in JFK's assassination, was ordered in the name of Alec Hydale. If anyone is looking for ballistics to provide a definitive answer in the Tippett case, they will be sorely disappointed. The ballistics evidence tends to exonerate Lee Oswald as much as it implicates him. Four shells from a .38 caliber handgun were recovered spread along the ground leading from the crime scene. The DPD officers on site at first figured these were from an automatic pistol, which automatically ejects the spent shells, not a revolver, because, who would purposely remove and leave such incriminating evidence at the scene, along with a wallet full of ID? The bullets found in Officer Tippett's body at autopsy could not be matched to Oswald's .38. And the shells so conveniently recovered at 10th and Patton could not be matched to the bullets. The cartridge cases found at the scene, two Western Winchester and two Remington Peters, simply didn't match the bullets, three Western Winchester and one Remington Peters recovered from Officer Tippett's body. In the words of homicide detective Jim Levell, the very man tasked with nailing Oswald for the Tippett murder, the ballistics in this case were quite frankly, a mess.